started. Welcome to our uh, records modernization uh, workshop series. Um, this is hosted by Quality Associates and by DocPoint Solutions. And we're really pleased to have you here with us today. This is an ongoing series. Many of you have been on some of our previous uh, sessions, um, but it is focused on particularly on the questions associated with records modernization um, within the government space and more particularly within the federal government space. So for those of you that aren't familiar with QAI, they offer a full range of uh, document scanning and imaging products and services um, that include hardware and software and integration services and training, and they particularly focus on M1921 and M2370 um, and on the broader questions of records modernization. Uh, DocPoint is a Microsoft partner with gold competencies in cloud productivity as well as collaboration and content and they focus uh, primarily on SharePoint and M365. So thank you for them for their support of this series. Um, there is a question tab so that um, we hopefully will have a little bit of time at the end of the session for questions. And so please feel free to post your questions. If we can't get to all of them during the course of our session, then we'll try to follow up with you after the session. Um, but I'm sure there'll be some some questions because we've uh, this is an area that's pretty new for people, and they're just starting to wrestle with the operational implications of what the new federal standards mean and what they mean in um, people's particular operating environments. So we're really pleased to uh, have uh, two really terrific folks um, with you today. Uh, I am John Mancini, for those of you who don't know me. Um, records and archives are personally important to me. Um, I wrote a book about that for those of you that are interested. Um, our two speakers are Jeff Reed, who's the National Scanning Program Coordinator at the Federal Record Center Program, and Kevin DeVorsey, who is Senior Electronic Records Policy Analyst. And Kevin will kick this off, and I'll allow him to introduce himself now. And then when we do the little flip about halfway through, um, Jeff will introduce himself at that point. So um, without further ado, let me hand off the uh, virtual microphone to uh, Kevin, and why don't we get started? All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, as the slide said, I'm Kevin Dvorsey. I am an electronic records policy analyst, and Jeff and I both work for uh, NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration. Um, I work in the office of the chief records officer, and we're the part of NARA that provides records management uh, policies, guidance, and regulations for federal agencies. And in the archives world, we talk about uh, content, context, and structure as being important. So I'm going to give a little context as to who Jeff and I are and where we come from. So NARA, the National Archives and Records Administration, uh, we are uh, the government's record keeper. And we have responsibility for caring for the records of all of the branches of our government. Um, and that is unusual. Uh, in many countries, each branch of a government will have their own archives, um, but we have the responsibility for all of our government. And then additionally, we have records management authority. And so Jeff will be able to talk about that. We, we run record centers located around the country. So next slide. All right, this is the oh my slide. Uh, you know, we have responsibility for the records of each branch of our government. And when you think about it, the volumes of information that our government produces, um, there's a process where we appraise it and identify those records that have permanent value. And that represents about two to 3% of all of records that are produced. And so here you can see just the vast volumes. Uh, I get overwhelmed when I look at it. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and so it, it, it being unusual in, in that we take care of the records of all branches of government, there are different rules in place for how those records are cared for. Um, there's two very significant pieces of the legislation, the Presidential Records Act and then the Federal Records Act. We care for the records of Congress, but unless a Congress member donates their records to us, they don't come into uh, our holdings. Um, now, for this conversation today, we're talking about our, our new regulations on digitizing records, and everything we're talking about applies to federal records and records governed by the Federal Records Act. 
So let's go to the next slide. All right, so to put this in perspective, um, why, why did we issue this regulation on digitizing records? Um, since I've been at NARA going back to uh, 2010 at least, we've been working step by step towards this idea of an all digital government, um, all digital records management. And things got jump started in 2014 when Congress revised the Federal Records Act. And you can see there's this quote from it, um, the archivist shall promulgate regulations establishing standards for the reproduction of records by photographic, microphotographic, or digital processes with a view to the disposal of the original records. And so what was new was the insertion of that phrase, digital processes. So it's a requirement for NARA to put out uh, regulations on digitization so that agencies can destroy the records once they've done that. Um, so in 2018, we adopted language into our strategic plan. In 2019, we worked with the Office of Management and Budget, uh, which is kind of the policy wing of the White House, and we released NARA Memorandum uh, M1921, which laid out targets for both federal agencies and uh, NARA um, to uh, move towards the stream of an all electronic government. Now, obviously, the pandemic occurs and uh, kind of threw things off. And so in uh, December of 2022, we released NAR, uh, OMB NARA Memorandum M2307, which doesn't replace M1921. They walk, work in conjunction, but it did shift some of the target dates in recognition of the impact of uh, the pandemic. Um, a, a significant one that applies directly to what we're talking about today is June 30th, 2024. And that's the date at which NARA's record centers will no longer accept transfers of paper or analog records to the fullest extent possible. Um, and kind of going off script at this point, uh, while we're here to talk about this digitization reg and the steps agencies should take if they have to uh, digitize records uh, for eventual transfer to the National Archives, you know, what you see on the screen, this isn't about digitization. This is about not using paper in your business process. Um, so we recognize that for years it, it's been common, even if records were created on a computer, agencies might have a business need to print things out for a wet, wet ink signature, or they received forms through the mail or via a fax machine. And so at a high level, all of this on the screen is moving towards that ideal of a fully digital government where records are created on a computer, they're used and managed on a computer, and if they're permanent, they're transferred to NARA in a digital form. Uh, so now we can go back on script and go to the next slide. So, all right, digitization. Um, there was this requirement in the Federal Records Act uh, for digitization. It didn't specify only permanent. And so a few years ago, we did release this digitization standard for temporary records. We're not gonna really discuss that today, but I have this slide up because it shows you kind of the brevity of that standard in comparison to what we've done with permanent records. And so as we publish rec uh, regulations, they are published in what's referred to as the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR. And so what you see is kind of the table of contents for this uh, regulation for temporary records. And it's pretty brief. Um, it gives a lot of authority to agencies as to how they digitize their temporary records prior to disposal, uh, disposal at the end of the process. And in short, as long as they can use them to meet their business purposes, they pretty much have authority to destroy them at the end. And now let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> and so this is the table of contents in the CFR for this recently released regulation for permanent records. And just at a glance, you can see the different in the level of detail that we've gone to, recognizing that these are permanent records. Um, and that at the end of this digitization pro process, agencies, again, are going to be authorized to destroy those source records. And so we went to uh, great measures to try and ensure that we've put out regulations that will uh, result in digital files uh, 
um, that will stand the test of time and can be used uh, by researchers in the future. So now you know, I'm not going to break down every part of this regulation, but I'm going to hit some of the, the high important parts uh, to give an idea of how we've approached this. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So you, you saw the language that was in the 2014 revision of the Federal Record Act, and it's pretty vague. Uh, it just requires us to publish standards and regulations for digitization. Um, it didn't tell us where to start or uh, how to go about that task. And so uh, you know, the, the first step was, how are we going to do this? Um, it made sense to address what is the the largest volume of material sitting on record center shelves, which is going to be paper. And so we've put out this regulation that applies to all paper. Um, it doesn't matter what size uh, material it's on, and therefore it extends to printed photographs. You can see we've also included mixed media, and I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later, um, but we didn't include uh, any materials that are digitized using different technologies. Um, so there, we don't address photographic negatives, motion picture film, microfiche, microfilm, or audio video records. Um, those will be coming later. And so next slide. <clears throat> All right. Now, uh, part of the, the novelty of this regulation is, is just that. It's a regulation. And we had to explain digitization in a way um, where we weave it into other records management requirements that are already up in the CFR. Um, and so it's kind of taking the, the concept of digitization or what in the past might have been referred to as conversion um, and made it a records management function. You're taking uh, an analog paper source and you're, you're essentially taking the recordness of that thing and putting it into a digital form. Um, and that's not an insignificant process. And one of the greatest concerns that we have is the records management aspect behind that. Um, and an example I would give is, you know, a digitization technician, they can tell you if you put 100 boxes with 1,000 sheets in each box in front of them, they can prove to you that they've scanned everything that they were presented with. You know, either they, they have one image for um, each page because there was only one information on one side, or they have two images for one, one for each side, but they can prove that. But what they can't prove is that if boxes were sitting on a shelf at headquarters because they were pulled for a FOIA request or a legal hold, your scanning technicians don't have that information. And so there are these requirements that agencies, you know, what we refer to as establishing intellectual and physical control of their records before they start digitizing. Make sure you understand what it is that you're proposing to digitize. And so that includes preparing an index so that uh, the people doing the scanning can, can work through and actually do quality management. But then also surveying the records to identify any preservation problems then significantly identifying the media types. You know, are, are you dealing with thermofax or onion skin or something that it's going to impact the type of equipment you buy? Um, in those cases, you know, a high-speed sheet-fed scanner is probably not going to be your best choice. But that's stuff you want to know before you start. Uh, you don't want to find that out when you've drawn, drawn up a contract and people are opening boxes. So let's go to the next slide. Documentation. Um, this is an, an interesting concept in this regulation. Um, it is, you know, if you look up any uh, digitization guidance, um, documentation about the process and the project are kind of a fundamental thing. Putting together a project plan, uh, a quality management plan, um, identify what quality control procedures you're going to follow. And you can see that bottom bullet. This documentation is going to be retained by the agencies. It does not come to the National Archives. Um, all of this documentation is to support agencies in their digitization e efforts should any questions arise. Um, but this is going to impact other parts of this regulation, as we'll see in a minute. So let's move to the next slide. Quality management requirements. Um, 
along with the records management requirements, quality management obviously is hugely important uh, if you're going to destroy the records at the end of the process. Um, a colleague, uh, Michael Horsley, who I worked with uh, along with uh, our supervisor, John Martinez, refers to it as total quality management. It's woven throughout this regulation. And the concept behind it is, you know, you don't digitize and then do spot checks at the end of the process. Um, you know, in the context that we're talking of the, the volumes, going back and having to pull boxes off shelves and start over when you found a mistake just isn't going to work. And so it's designed to, uh, as much as possible, anticipate problems or uh, identify them in the moment so that they can be uh, uh, fixed on the spot rather than having to go back and start over with your digitization. Um, and that involves uh, you know, regularly inspecting your equipment, ensuring that it's actually capable of doing what it's required to do before you purchase it, um, and other things that we'll see in a, in a second. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So the quality management in this regulation leans heavily on something referred to as uh, FAGI, the Federal Agency's Digital Guideline Initiative. And so this is a, kind of a, a little bit of history here. Um, and I'm glad you know, Jeff is here to talk to it since he was involved in this. Um, but FAGI is a collaboration and it's led by the Library of Congress. And NARA has been involved with it for, for years. Um, and it has put out these guidelines. You can see there's a 2010, 2016, and an updated 2023 version, which are guidelines for digitizing cultural heritage material. And those guidelines were actually originally based on NARA's guidelines for digitizing archival materials for electronic access, the 2010 version. Um, and many of you may know uh, that was produced by, by uh, Steve Puglia, Aaron Rhodes, and Jeff Reed. And uh, either of these, I would encourage you to look at because they're remarkable documents. Um, and they do something that we cannot do in our regulations. They explain how and why some of this works. Um, our regulations are, are pretty dry, and they are a series of must statements explaining to agencies what they must do. Um, they, they don't do a good job of explaining why you have to do it because uh, it's a very lengthy regulation as it is and to try and explain digitization in that way uh, would take hundreds of pages. So, you know, I've included the links and I really would um, encourage people to go take a look. But what this did, um, it saved us a lot of effort in that we didn't have to try and figure out what parameters should people scan at so that at the end of the process they can destroy the record that work had been done through this collaboration between the library of congress the national archives um, and image scientists to come up with you can see here there are these test targets to verify the performance of equipment and so this is that quality management running through this regulation is um, not only we're not just stating that here are the parameters you must meet but you got to prove that you're meeting them and this is how you do it. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so uh, woven into it uh, as a records management um, regulation, we've included a variety of file formats, but then also compression codecs that can be used. Um, you know, there are vastly different sized agencies um, digitizing for digi different reasons to meet different um, business processes. And so it's impossible for us to just say, everybody's gonna use this one format and this one compression type. So we've done our best to identify some common ones. We've also included some compression types recognizing the potentially vast volumes of material and um, storage space requirements. So let's go to the next slide. All right, uh, so the digitization requirements themselves, um, we, I, I mentioned that we've addressed you know, pretty much anything on paper, but we have subdivided the regulation into two major um, parts, and that is basically paper documents, but then also printed photographs. Um, and the, you know, this is based on the requirements specified in FAGI, 
And the difference is the requirements for printed photographs are a little bit higher than that for documents. And so if agencies have documents with fine details, um, then we instruct them to use the uh, parameters for printed photographs. Um, you know, I've said that the, the equipment needs to be appropriate for the media type and cap you know, you have to prove that it's capable of meeting your project objectives um, and then it, it implement the quality analysis uh, using those test targets and regularly test your equipment to identify any errors or, or failures that are occurring. So let's go to the next slide. I mentioned earlier that we included instructions for mixed media. Um, you know, it is not uncommon to open a box of paper and be surprised by finding uh, a CD, a DVD, a USB thumb drive, a zip drive, or other types of uh, storage media. Um, you know, since we're talking about boxes of federal records, it's important for us to include these instructions uh, because at the end of the day, this uh, agencies have to assume that everything is a record until they prove that it's not a record. And so this section of the regulation includes instructions on how to do that. You know, even if it's a floppy disk, you're obligated to go find a computer with a floppy drive so that you can figure out what's on that disk and whether or not those are federal records. Do they relate to the paper in the box or are they something else altogether? Um, so th this section is important, uh, a little bit different, but important. So let's go ahead. Metadata. Um, metadata, you know, obviously in digitization, metadata is always an important consideration. In this regulation, where the source records are going to be destroyed at the end, it takes on an even greater importance. The documentation about the project is not going to come along to the National Archives. So these digital files really have to be able to stand on their own. And a big part of that is through the metadata that must be captured. And so we've included different types of metadata, administrative metadata, descriptive metadata, um, rights, re uh, re metadata relating to any restrictions that are in place. So if there's security classified or there's PII, um, CUI or copyright, all of that information has to transfer from the source records over to the digital records so that we can maintain them properly um, and that the discoverable in the future. We've also included technical metadata so that we can preserve things in the future <clears throat> and instructions on the use of checksums uh, so that agencies can monitor for corruption or alteration through time since they may not transfer them to NARA for a number of years. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Validation. Validation is a relatively new concept. It appeared in the temporary regulation and uh, notice based on some of the questions that we've received in the past, it, it's easy to misunderstand. This is a distinct process from quality control or quality management. This is a high level process at the end of digitization where an agency reviews what they've done and ensures and makes a statement that they have complied with this regulation. And once they've done that, they are authorized to dispose of the source records. And so, uh, you know, as a significant um, process, we, you know, there is huge disparity in the size and staffing of federal agencies. So we haven't specified an, a role or an individual in each agency that should do that. But we do give some instructions and encourage you know, agency records officers to meet with their general counsel to figure out in our agency who's the right person to make this important call. Um, so let's go to the next slide. All right, uh, I mentioned that part of the complexity of uh, generating this as a regulation was weaving it into the CFR. Um, it, you know, I've kind of flown through what is there, and we've recognized that it can be a bit overwhelming for agencies. So we've generated a lot of additional information, including I think we have nine blog posts where we drill down into specific subjects um, to make it fit in the GSR, uh, CFR. We've had to update the general record schedules that relate, so they're now in sync with the language in this regulation, and we're continuing to develop additional guidance and also 
we've begun work on the next set of uh, regulations for film records. And next slide. And we've pulled all this information together onto our records management website. And so you can see this page and I would encourage anybody um, who's going to undertake this work. We've tried to identify you know, anything that you might be interested in relating to the digitization of federal records and pulled it together here. And we're going to continue adding uh, new materials as soon as we complete them. All right. And uh, Jeff, over to you. And yeah, before you. before hopping over to um, to Jeff, one thing that I just wanted to underscore, and thank you so much, Kevin. That was really really insightful in terms of giving people the lay of the land. But um, I really wanted to highlight that pie chart that you had with three different kinds of records, because I think there's been an assumption in some of the conversations I've had with people that this applies to everything. Um, it applies only to that one third pie that you talked about earlier. And within that one third pie, it only applies to the permanent records for Ascension to NARA that are, and the, and I remember Michael Horsley at one point sent me some um, comments that I thought were really right on target. And he said, the reason for all of the rigor in the regulations, you know, which are much more specific than exist for temporary records is because these are kind of like the permanent, permanent records, and it gives authority to destroy the originals. And that's why they're so rigorous. And I, and I just wanted to highlight that because that's something I tend to forget. And I think it's, it's something important for people to remember. So uh, take it away, Jeff. Thank you, John. And, and I hope I've been active enough. I, I've discovered back in the office that our energy savings uh, measures are over aggressive. <laughs> So if, if I suddenly go dark, we haven't lost power, I'll, I'll be back in just a second. Um, so as John said at the start, I'm the National Scanning Program Coordinator for the Federal Record Center Program at the National Archives. Uh, the Federal Record Center Program provides fee-based services to federal agencies, most importantly, storage, reference, and disposition services that are 18 record centers. Um, in addition to storage, one of the services we've been providing is scanning, both project-based scanning of larger groups of records that are four document conversion units, as well as file or folder level scanning in response to reference requests at all their centers. My office provides coordination and support for scanning operations across the Record Center program. As a document conversion special, specialist, um, my office, like many of you in the audience, has been examining the new regulation from an operations perspective to determine the changes we would have to put into effect for scanning permanent records in adherence with the regulation. Because I'm a service provider, but also a federal agency employee, please forgive me for any shifting in my point of view during the presentation. I can kind of hop back and forth. Um, next slide, please. So Kevin's done a great job of summarizing what the regulation says and, and some of the background of why it's there. My intention is to highlight the parts of the regulation that might necessitate changes to existing approaches and processes. Basically what's different from comic work workflows or needs special attention. Um, however, you will see a lot of overlap between uh, what Kevin discussed and what I did. I'm just trying to provide a different perspective from the operations point of view of, of what to watch out for. Um, because we're not discussing making a second copy to enable additional methods of working, uh, but instead we're making the copy that will be used by everyone point forward when the source records are destroyed, the stakes are dramatically higher in all aspects of the digitization process, require a higher level of vigor, as John said, than previously applied in most cases. Um, there are folks out there who have been doing some or even all of what's specified in the regulation already, especially if they're closer to the cultural heritage space, so I apologize if this is old hat for you all but perhaps you can help us by contributing your experience and the questions and answers at the end. Um, I'm not gonna march line by line through the regulation either, uh, but I'll touch on the key points regarding the areas listed in the slide here. Um, I move validation to the top of the list, even though it's the last section of 36 CFR subpart E, because I think it's the most critical step and a relatively new activity in the federal records digitization process. As, as uh, Kevin mentioned, it appeared just a few years ago in subpart D for the first time on digitizing temporary records. Uh, next slide, please, John. So you'll recall that Kevin noted in his slide about validation uh, that agencies should consult with their general counsel, and that's because of the importance and seriousness of the activity, even though it's only a half a page of the regulation. Um, my personal interpretation of the validation step is that it's the agency's acceptance of, ris of risk of legal action if someone challenges the trustworthiness of the digitized records. It's a formal affirmation that no new issues were introduced to the digitized records and old issues were not carried over from the source records. Ultimately, it's a confirmation that the process is defensible. 
Therefore, much of the planning and documentation steps need to be geared towards supporting this end of the process validation step. Next slide, please, John. So I'll note here that some of the steps of the process cannot easily be delegated to a service provider and may need to be carried out by those with the responsibility for managing the records being digitized. Um, as Kevin brought up, you know, there's, there's work to be done by the agency uh, to prepare for, for this process um, that can easily be just handed off to, to somebody else. Um, this is especially true for establishing intellectual control. The wallet service provider can confirm they captured every scannable item they were given. That's not exactly the same as an agency knowing that every part of a set of records has been digitized or accounted for. Gaps in the source records, which may not be recognized by a service provider, cannot simply be mirrored as gaps in the digitized records. Missing or incomplete records must be identified, as well as the existence and location of record parts within a set that cannot or will not be digitized. They have to be digitized because the complete mixed media file will no longer exist physically uh, to provide the context and arrangement information that you would get from just looking in a box and seeing what's in the folder. Um, in addition to establishing intellectual control, the ongoing collection of documentation throughout the process begins in the planning phase with project and quality management plans. These plans will need to include information that may not have been compiled into a single docket before, such as equipment acceptance testing results or procedures that may have previously only been a vendor's internal standard operating procedure. The purpose of amassing more thorough documentation is to provide the agency with the information necessary to perform that all important validation step. Um, while discussing project and quality management plans, I need to point out that 300 DPI color PDF or grayscale PDF are no longer sufficient descriptions of the final product to be created. And selecting equipment because it can produce a 300 DPI PDF file is not adequate. The equipment and processes must be tested for producing products that comply with more thorough image quality parameters, which we'll discuss shortly. Next slide, please, John. So there are a number of quality assurance details that may be different from what we might have been doing prior. Uh, while quality control checks on finished products is commonplace, process control may not be a universal practice at this time. Testing prior to scanning to know that equipment, software, and people are all on target before scanning, and then ongoing monitoring of the pipeline might be new for some. Uh, for, for, for those who come from a film processing and photo printing background, process control may be familiar to you. But reading and graphing control strips was an internal process usually, and generally the results weren't provided to customers for inspection. Uh, for permanent records digitization, test target images or their values are likely to be um, provided to agency for review and ultimately used to support validation. So in order to do digitization process control, as well as the uh, previously mentioned acceptance testing, targets and analysis software will need to be used, which might not be in your current toolbox. Uh, you, you saw some pictures of some of the targets in, in Kevin's slides that, that uh, might be used. Um, so there's a little item that might not have stood out alongside the bigger headlines in the regulation, and that's the requirement to use calibrated graphics workstations for visual inspection. Uh, while this is customary for many service providers, it may be new to agencies digitizing their own records and might not be a part of the regular equipment inventory provided by or supported by IT departments. Um, at the least, this requirement may be a new addition to contract language and could create additional documentation for the quality management folder. Another requirement is that visual inspection must be done on final products. So workflows that aggregate images into a multi-page file need to be inspected after export. If your scanning management software includes a QC module before the export stage, another QC step outside that software might need to be added to your workflow. Uh, my final note about quality assurance is about inspection for completeness. Uh, some workflows may be using sampling methods to confirm every required page has been captured and in the correct sequence, which may be acceptable when there's a safety net of source records stored away. Verifying that 100% of the informational content that has been captured may require more stringent and layered procedure for the validation team to be comfortable with authorizing the destruction of the source records. The regulation doesn't provide specifics on how completeness has to be verified, but prevailing cautious methods such as 100% page to image comparison and especially double 100% comparison could be significant effort and cost for agencies to consider. Next slide, please. Uh, so there's a lot of interest in the technical requirements, and some might have assumed that the tables and numbers are the heart of the regulation. Um, I hope the presentation so far has emphasized that this isn't just about scanning, uh, but rather it's about records, man uh, records management activity with the intent to complete the transformation of how go government conducts work. Uh, right now, we just have to get past this long tail of paper records that are out there. So there are technical requirements, and I'll point out a few of the most notable shifts from prior document conversion works for you to be aware of. Um, 
So it's, uh, PDF is allowable for modern textual records, but it must be a version of PDF A. And PDF is not allowable for photo prints and paper records with fine details. However, photo prints interspersed with predominantly textual records may be included in PDF file, but beware the measurement parameter aims for photo prints must still be met. So multiple workflows may need to be set up to accommodate records comprised of textual or photo or textual with intersp interspersed photo materials. Um, there is no photo compression allowed, J JPEG compression allowed, I'm sorry. Um, it's less likely that folks using uh, are using the JPEG file format, um, although if you are, note that it's not allowed in the regulation. Um, but JPEG compression can slip in when creating other file formats, so you need to check your PDF creation tool to make sure that an acceptable compression codec is being used. Um, bitonal and black and white and one bit are all terms used uh, to describe a color mode often employed in document scanning. It is not allowed, so, any just, so an adjustment may need to be made to your scanning process as well as your data storage planning. Uh, not only is bitonal not allowed for any record type, but photo prints must be scanned in color even if they're black and white. And the sRGB color space is not allowed for photo prints. Um, so this is a good point to, put, to, a good point, to point out that uh, color management may be new to some and software will need to be checked for implementation of ICC color management, which is not universal in the document scanning space. Next slide, please, John. So I said we come back to the image quality parameters. Um, here we are. Um, where previous performance work statements often just specified a short list of characters, characteristics that could support good digital images, uh, namely sampling frequency, color mode, and file format, which you see on the left. Uh, now we have a, a list of measurable image parameters that have been agreed upon by imaging experts to ensure accurate conversion of paper records to digital images. Um, as you can see, this list doesn't replace the traditional big three. Um, they're, they're still in there, uh, but it does add additional parameters to become familiar with. Um, there are great resources on the FADU website for learning more about uh, these parameters, so I won't uh, run through and describe them here. The important point is uh, now there are obje objective measures to prove that an image pipeline is or was producing images during that are compliant with the capture specifications in the regulation. And this proof can flow into the quality management documentation for the validation process. Uh, next slide, please, John. So finally, metadata. Uh, past scanning projects have all had some amount of metadata requirements, uh, ranging from the minimalist approach of just a file naming convention to extensive indexing of created and captured data. Uh, most of what I've seen requested in our, uh, in our uh, office has been geared towards information needed for the immediate use of the digital copies, uh, which isn't a bad thing. We should be using the copies. We put so much effort into creating. Um, but as, as Kevin pointed out, uh, when planning to destroy the source records, uh, there needs we need to expand the metadata capture to include information for future uses of the digitized records once they're no longer um, in, in the business use of the agency and accession by the National Archives. So knowing what the source materials were and how the digital copies were created will be helpful for, to future users, but it may take additional effort to, to uh, record that information. Um, ensuring the required metadata is captured and retained in the required locations, especially embedded in files, might call for some investigation and adjustment to software used to ensure that metadata automatically or manually embedded early in the process isn't unintentionally stripped out during later, later file processing. Some metadata is required to be maintained in multiple locations and agencies will need to ensure it remains consistent at all locations. Um, page level metadata may be more difficult to examine in PDF files than file level metadata depending on the software used. So once again, I'll emphasize the importance and newness of the relation elements. Uh, metadata will have to provide the connections between record parts that physical arrangement would have provided if the source records were kept. Uh, next slide, please. So the metadata elements that have caused more careful consideration for us because they've not traditionally been requested, either because the additional effort to create or they were not necessary for the business use of the records, or the access and use restrictions, rights information, uh, source type and dimensions of, of the records being scanned, uh, scanner, camera, make, and model, and software name and version. Um, some of these, like the scanner, make, and model, uh, some software automatically in inserts, but as I mentioned, you've got to watch out for, for downstream processes that might actually strip that out, and you want to make sure it remains. Um, record ID, however, um, might be predetermined before, before scanning and ingesting into a record keeping system, but in many cases, it'll be generated as part of the ingest process. So agencies will need to plan for embedding this element after the digitization process is completed. So not all of the steps that, that are described here to ensure that there is a good uh, set of digitized records will happen um, sort of in the scanning bubble 
Um, there's some, some downstream processes that may have to happen at the agency after they receive their copies from their internal office or, or, or an outside contractor. Um, and, and so finally, I will mention the relation elements again. Uh, they may occur infrequently, but procedures will need to be dis determined while establishing intellectual control and then documented in the project plan. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you for listening and I'll hand the mic back to John for, for questions. Great, thank you all very much. Um, that was extremely uh, comprehensive and uh, I was building this in one of my blog posts associated with this as everything you wanted to know about the uh, new regs but we're afraid to ask and uh, now it's the afraid to ask part. So uh, we've got some questions teed up. I have some questions. Um, I've also heard some questions from people in um, anticipation of this session. So if it's okay with you guys, what I'd like to do is try to do those in almost like a lightning round kind of thing. So uh, give me a little high sign when uh, when you're the one that uh, wants to answer that question, and we'll see if we can plow through as, um, as many as we can. So if that's okay with you guys, we'll proceed that way. All right, first question. I get this all the time. Um, um, if a vendor says that their equipment is FADGI compliant, does that mean that it meets the requirements of NARA's regulation? <laughs> Who wants it? All right, go ahead. So, so I, I hope that question was, was, was asked early and, and that we pointed out there's a lot of other uh, activities that surround the actual digital capture portion. And so while the foundation is that, that equipment must be able to produce uh, images that meet the standards, um, there, there's a whole range of other activities that have to happen either by the person doing the scanning or the agency who, who hold those records. So um, just having a, 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 a FADGI check on, on your equipment does not guarantee that you're meeting the regulations. So maybe related to that, somebody uh, said, uh, we've just bought a bunch of scanning, scanning equipment prior to publication of this. Um, if it's not um, FADGI 3 ca capable, what guidance do you have? I will take that one. Um, we are working on a, a document, FAQs, um, for agencies that have already digitized or begun digitizing, and it'll lay out all of the options that are available to agencies in that case. Uh, so look forward to that. That will be coming soon. Great. Um, how about, um, is there any guidance for agencies on how they should digitize records um, that are already in possession of the FRCs until they're ascended to NARA? Well, well, the easy answer is you don't have to. So oh, okay. if, if they're already in the door before the, before the June uh, 2024 deadline, which uh, I believe still, Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong, still means that, that the transfer has been approved and, and the physical records can come in after June 24th, not too long behind, but the, the deadline is really about approving the transfer. So once once they're in the record center program, there's no requirement that they be scanned for the eventual move to, to the National Archives. Um, there are cases where once an agency has put their records in, in the uh, record center, they may need access to individual parts. And we do support uh, reference requests uh, delivered digitally through our smart scan program, where a, a file or folder can be requested. We'll, we'll digitize and send it back. This will not be a, a, a file that, that meets the regulations. Um, this is intended as a reference copy. The physical records will still remain in the record center and be moved to the archives at their disposition date. But this is a, a method of gaining access to those files um, while they're in, in the record center. So, so ding, 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 that might have been an important point in terms of future business for the federal record centers that once they're in, you have a little bit of cover. Yes. Okay. Um, have you guys or anybody else developed any um, cost tables or estimates for what it would cost to implement the new regs? We have not. Um, and that might be something. There, there are other um, groups of agencies, such as uh, the FRON, that might undertake that work. And so um, if they want to, our, our email, our group's email is RM standards, so records management standards at nara.gov. Any question like that, um, I, I will track that down and get you a good answer. Um, but we have not, uh, as you can imagine, you know, we, the complexity of developing a regulation that applies to all of the federal agencies in the U.S. government is very complex. And trying to narrow things down and say, this is what it's going to cost is um, is very complex. There are so many, you know, it seems like the answer is 
it depends and it really does depend on so many different factors but um, if they email us i will do a, 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 my best to track down a good better answer than that how about are you guys um oh i'm sorry go ahead go ahead Jeff. I, I was just gonna if, if kevin allow i'll jump in and re-emphasize some of the points early on that you know the the regulation is not a mandate to to digitize everything you have and and so agencies do need to be uh, judicious and, and careful about deciding what actually needs to be digitized versus what can actually be um, moved to the National Archives. Um, and, and the purpose of, of all of this effort is to transition to a, an electronic workflow as opposed to simply scanning uh, the paper and making more paper and scanning more paper. Uh, but so um, the, the regulations focus on what really needs to be done when you need to scan um, but rather than, than looking to see uh, how much it costs, uh, we focus on, on scan less and, and transfer yeah. more. It's, um, it, it, it's always gonna, you know, the, the best option is always gonna be, if you can transfer your records to a record center before the deadline, um, because at, you know, Jeff did a wonderful job of explaining, you know, the, the source records are getting destroyed. And so we can, own, you know, the bar has to be at a certain point to ensure for the future that these digital versions are gonna be sufficient. Um, and so it's never gonna be cheap, whatever cheap means. Um, so. Are there, um, there, there's a question of, um, does the original source material have to be destroyed after it's been digitized and the process validated? <laughs> um, technically, no. Um, agencies can retain the source material should they choose to. However, you know, the, the records management side of me uh, would caution them. Um, and I would definitely check with my general counsel first, because if you think about it, you know, should a FOIA request come in, you're going to be obligated to do discovery on digital versions and then the source material. So there will be an expense incurred in trying to maintain the source records. Um, but technically, uh, we do not require that you dis dispose of them. Um, so another question maybe tied to that was that um, are agencies required to hang on to the source records until NARA takes legal hold of the digitized record, that interim period? That is not a requirement of the regulation. Uh, it's not a terrible idea. It, it, again, meet with your general counsel and see what your comfort level is. But once you have validated that your records comply with the regulation, you are authorized to dispose of them according to the instructions in the record schedule or uh, the GRS, the general record schedule. So here's an interesting one, which I've kind of wondered about too, is that um, if our temporary records have a 50 year retention requirement, pretty long retention requirement, um, should we still follow temporary standards for digitization or should they be digitized at the higher standard for permanent records given how long the retention period is? I, I can take that. Um, it's a great question and we've received this a few times. And you know, my advice is, you, know, there, you could see the complexity comparison between the temporary reg and the, the permanent reg. Um, my advice would be to look through the permanent regulation and see what aspects of it apply to long-term retention. Things like uh, the metadata, especially, we included checksums. Um, and what are checksums? It's a mechanism um, where you can monitor electronic records of any time. It doesn't have to be digitized records. And uh, if I, I, I've done this, you can do it. If, if you create a Word document and save it and generate a checksum and then open up that Word doc and change one character and save it and generate a new checksum, it's going to be different. Um, it, it's almost analogous. If you go to the bank, you know, they, they weigh money, they don't count it. Um, and that, that's kind of how checksums work. If anything changes in that file, you'll know about it. And so there are things, if you were going to maintain records for 50 years, there are aspects of that permanent regulation that will certainly support that. Um, but there is a cost involved. So I would be very discerning in looking at it and seeing what makes sense in those specific, uh, instances. Do you guys anticipate training sessions um, for records officers in the federal government on all of this? Um, okay, you know, NARA is a very complex organization and there are other components. We are working on training. Um, whether or not it's aimed specifically at records officers, I think it's, it's aimed more broadly at agency staff. 
Um, but we have been uh, working with our training team to develop training around this new regulation. So that will be forthcoming. How about, um, will NARA be revisiting the 15, 15 year transfer requirement for most permanent records to be transferred? Um, and the comment by the person is that 15 years in a digital format is too long. That's an interesting question that I don't know the answer to. Um, that, but that is worth um, pointing out that you know this process is moving you know the permanent recordness from a source record to a digital version, and part of that is the disposition that applied to the source record now applies to the digital version, and so in some cases that could be decades. You know, I, I, we've met with agencies, and it's like, well, you'll be seeing these in 2032. Um, so that is a consideration, is how are we going to maintain uh, these records uh, and, you know, what, when should we start digitizing them uh, based on this disposition date? This relates to a question we had previously, is do you anticipate a list of recommended vendors that agencies can reach out to that are have processes that are consistent with all this? NARA traditionally and probably implicit in this is how do we get on it, but anyway. <laughs> we don't recommend them, um, but, but there is work going on that Kevin mentioned working with GSA. Um, so vendors can uh, self certify and get on, on the mass contracts. Uh, so they're identified as, as vendors who do this work, um, but NARA would not be in a position to recommend any. Another question here does, um, does all this mean that everything needs to be OCR'd? Ah. Um, good question. No, that is not a requirement of this regulation. Um, agencies are free to OCR um, to comply with other business needs, and we will accept those records. But OCR is kind of a different form of digitization, and it's it's just not a requirement of this regulation. And a question here, I think you covered this, but I, to be honest, I can't remember the answer, um, <laughs> is when do you anticipate having uh, guidance regarding video and film? We have begun work on the next regulation. Um, this one took quite a while, you know, the pandemic slowed things down. But now that we have this template in place, the hope is that we'll be able to address film more quickly. Now, audio, video, and motion pictures are somewhat distinct time-based media. And again, I would strongly encourage anybody with permanent records of that material type to consider transferring transferring them to a record center prior to the deadline, because uh, you know we know how to scan paper. Scanning paper is pretty straightforward compared to scanning VHS tapes or motion picture film. The cost is going to go up when you get to that. And so, if you you know, are people really using VHS tapes in the course of their day to day business? <laughs> um, you know, do, do you really need to hang on to those? Or if there's any way you can transfer them, I would encourage you to transfer them. <laughs> and um, gosh, let me just double check. I think I've covered all or most of these. Let's see. Do, 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 do. I think you covered this, but it, um, Maybe you just talk about this one more time. What is the implication of the checksum option? In other words, uh, yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that. All right. Um, so I, I mentioned that checksums are a way of kind of measuring a file, and you know they're they're used all the time. If if you put uh, records in the cloud, your cloud vendor is using checksums to monitor for corruption. Um, and so we included that instruction. You know, it, currently in the CFR, we do have requirements uh, for maintaining electronic records, um, but they're pretty high level. They, you know, it's your obligation to make sure authenticity, reliability, integrity is maintained. Um, checksums are a very specific way of accomplishing that. And due to the, the length of um, some of the disposition periods, we wanted to include these kind of instructions just to remind agencies that you don't want to digitize a huge volume of material and then put it on a hard drive on a shelf. That's not, you know, there's no guarantee that in 15 years when you want to transfer that to, to NARA that something hasn't gone wrong. So uh, checksums are a way of monitoring your records uh, to you know, make sure nothing bad has happened to them. And then one last question here that I have, um, which is maybe more of a 23, 2307 question rather than a, a new reg question, but um, if we have permanent records that need to be kept as paper for legal reasons, 
I'm guessing maybe this is a wet ink kind of requirement or some such thing like that. Um, will NARA no longer take them after June 24? Um, you know, part of the language is to the fullest extent possible. And so there are going to be exceptions to everything. Um, and we do have, you know, if you, if you go up on that website and follow that link, there is an exceptions process and agencies can request an exemption or an extension uh, to the deadlines to based on, depending on the scenario that they're in. So if you do have some other conflicting legal requirement, there is a process for you to follow. So we're just about out of time. I want to thank you guys for your patience with my lightning round questions, because I know it's uh, we got to a lot, and I really appreciate that and answered on, on a lot of questions here. I'm going to ask you in a minute for kind of one key takeaway for folks, so you might want to think about that while I talk. Um, if you, anybody has any questions about any of this, feel free to contact me at jmancini77 at gmail.com. As I mentioned, this is part of an ongoing series. We will send you the PowerPoint. We will also send you the recording. Feel free to share both of those with um, any of your colleagues that might have questions about this. Um, I will say that NARA has been doing a terrific job of um, with blog posts and with the webinar that you all had a couple of weeks ago and ongoing stuff that you all are doing. So everybody should really make sure that they, they log on to those and um, become conversant because this is a really pretty fundamental shift, I think in how we approach, um, you know, I've been in the imaging business for 25 uh, dog years, a yeah, long, long time. And um, I think what's so interesting now is we've always had this very ambiguous definition of what a good image or a good process is. And um, this, is a, this is a real effort to quantify what that looks like. And I'm sure there'll be um, issues that arise as we get into this, but that's what implementation is really all about. And one, and I had two key takeaways that I wanted to just mention. Um, one from Kevin, again, I like the pie chart with presidential records, congressional records and federal records because you know there are nuances and differences there associated with that. And um, Jeff, on your side, that bullet that you had, um, acceptance of risk of legal action by the agency really caught my attention as something that people ought to pay attention to. And I also have some questions that generated in my head about how that acceptance of legal risk carries back down into the partners that people deal with um, when, you know, when they outsource some of this work to folks. So something to explore in the future. So one final uh, comment, maybe uh, why don't we start with you, Jeff, and then Kevin, you'll have the final word. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just go back to your comment about that validation step. And, and so throughout the process, whether you're the agency planning or, or your um, a, a vendor who, who's providing services, you know, we, we need to be conscious of providing the right information back to, to that, that agency so that they can do that validation step. Um, they, they need the right information. They're not going to redo the entire QC process, uh, but they do need to be able to confirm that the proper process uh, was set up and followed. And Kevin, the final word. All right. Um, again, I would encourage agencies to really uh, get an understanding of what records you're considering digitizing and take a hard look and see, can we transfer these before the deadline? What is our rationale for hanging on to this material and digitizing it? Um, you know, th that is always going to be uh, your best bet is to just, you know, make it NARA's problem. Give it to us and let us take care of it, especially if it's something complex like uh, motion picture or audio video material. So thank you all in the audience for attending. Thank you for the terrific questions. And uh, Jeff and Kevin, thank you so much for um, your patience with me and my fireball questions coming at you. And uh, thanks again. I'm sure there'll be a follow up along the way, but thanks everybody. And we'll see you the next time.